All right, dry riverbed. Got the cracked soil and everything. When we think of the desert southwest of the United States, we think hot. Phoenix, Tucson, Las Vegas, you know, the scorching heat out there, the drought that we hear about. But, you know, it does rain out there, obviously. And that rain can come from several sources each year, including from tropical systems coming up from the Eastern Pacific. But then we have the Gulf of California. Low pressure trough sets up, lower levels, and then you get a general easterly counterclockwise flow that way. And the upper levels will have the easterly flow from the persistent high. So general east flow from east to west. That helps pull moisture from the Gulf of Mexico sometimes, and then from the southwest from the Gulf of California. We've had microbursts. We've had big rain shafts coming down. We've had floods. We've had, unfortunately, people drown in the washes out here because when it rains out here, the water rises so quick. It's not like in the south where you can get inches and inches of rain. It is this Gulf of California region and indeed the entire Eastern Pacific during hurricane season anyway, that really piques my interest for very dramatic weather from time to time in the desert southwest of the United States. So right, tropical systems can affect the desert southwest. You wouldn't think that when you live in the landlocked desert southwest that a hurricane from the Pacific Ocean or from even the Gulf of Mexico can impact your weather, but it does and it does in a big way because a hurricane doesn't just come and hit the coast and stop, it keeps on moving and it loses its intensity. But as it does that, it tends to rain itself out and we've seen it happen a lot where it rains itself out in the desert southwest of the U.S. It's pretty rare, but I tell you, if you're going to come vacation here during the peak of hurricane season, check the Pacific. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, the effects can be quite dramatic, not only to the natural landscape, which becomes flooded and springs to life with these dry arroyos or washes filling up with water and raging for a couple of days, but to cities like Phoenix, Tucson, Las Vegas, and even in southwest Utah. Okay. Hi. So we get to the end of July and I really wanted to go out to the western part of the United States and observe what little monsoon activity there was. Unfortunately, it was not very prominent during the 2020 season. The monsoon just didn't really show up like it was you know, hoped that it would. And kind of related to that, I wanted to research these burn scars from the wildfires, mainly in the mountains of Arizona. That was something that was very interesting to me and how it could relate to potential future flash flooding, especially if we were to get any tropical activity to come up that way, even in subsequent years. So I took a couple of my kids with me. I figured let them come out and see what dad does out there in the great desert Southwest. Hot. Hot. Go this way. It's so hot. <laughs> it's so hot. It's like lava. Well, that's exactly what it is. Snow Canyon is made up of both this really interesting sandstone left over from basically petrified sand dunes from a long time ago and volcanic activity from the region when it was volcanically active. You get these lava flows that have solidified now into these areas of dark, very hard lava tubes. Just a really unique area that I came to know about back in 2014 when I was in the region for a hurricane that actually moved up out of the Eastern Pacific, brought a lot of moisture to the area, that hurricane was Norbert. 
And whether it's the Gulf of Mexico or the Pacific side, and sometimes you get them coming from both directions. We've seen that happen before, where a system comes up out of the Gulf of Mexico. And again, it's, it's kind of running out of steam as it gets into the desert southwest, but it's still going and it's still raining and it slows down and it stalls. Then it brings tremendous amounts of rain. And at the same time, a system can come up out of the Pacific, come across Cabo San Lucas, up through the Gulf of California, and end up in the same place. And you can end up with just huge amounts of rain. And you can go from dry with fires to flooding just like that. I worked with Kerry on what turned out to be an extensive several days long trek into the southwest United States tracking down this moisture plume coming in from both Norbert and the remnants of Dolly. All of this leading to a lot of flooding that even resulted in loss of life unfortunately in Arizona. A very very big news making event and it exposed me for the first time in my career to this little known but very important aspect of tropical cyclones, and that is their interaction with the desert southwest. Good afternoon to you, Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com here in St. George, Utah. That's right, St. George, Utah. This is the Virgin River. What was once Hurricane Norbert, now working its way into the southern part of Arizona, all the way up into Utah, Nevada, parts of California. Brought a lot of rain to the Las Vegas Valley and the surrounding areas. Not too far from here, the Moapa Valley basically got destroyed by floodwaters. Parts of Interstate 15, the biggest interstate that runs through the state of Nevada, totally washed out, destroyed, vans and cars floating off the road, up hitting overpasses with all of that water, all from a hurricane, and you'd never think that would happen here. Um, it usually gets reported as monsoonal type weather. The, the, the humid stuff coming up from the Gulf of California or uh, off the Gulf of Mexico across Texas and New Mexico. Same thing when I lived in Southern California. They'd say, yeah, you're getting a little bit of moisture off of a storm down in Mexico, but look at this monsoon, you know. Well, there's definitely a difference between the so-called North American monsoon, which hopefully occurs each summer to varying degrees, of course, to bring moisture into the region and when we get a dying hurricane coming up from the Pacific, that is what happened in 2014 that brought Carrie and me out to the region. So after several days of tracking down all this moisture from Phoenix up through Las Vegas, and then eventually ending up there in Southwest Utah, Carrie and I finally got to see things kind of come together in rather dramatic fashion as a trough came in from the Pacific, helping to kind of squeeze out that remnant moisture of Norbert. And it resulted in quite a bit of flooding over there in Snow Canyon, which is just northwest of St. George. And it provided me with the opportunity to see something that I had never seen before in person. I mean, this was remarkable. The desert was transformed into this temporary sort of water world. You know, it's like geologic time is sped up just for this brief time period that the moisture is up there from this remnant hurricane. So you got waterfalls coming off the sides of the canyons, this erosion and deposition happening right in front of your eyes. And then when it's over, everything goes back to sort of being paradoxically frozen in time. A few more minutes and we have yeah. Gotta get going. We have a lot to see today. Like this what? Is, and you'll see. <laughs> this is just a taste. Bringing two of my kids with me to this very spot to impress upon them how truly unique this part of the country really is was very special to me. I'm very glad that I did it. It was neat to be able to be out there and just kind of see how things were. Uh, again, remembering that I was there with Carrie back in 2014, but also I wanted to dig a little deeper into this overall notion that this part of the country is constantly battling heat and drought, fire and rain.
2020 wildfire season was once again terrible out west and seeing this sort of post-apocalyptic burned out landscape was surreal, absolutely. And then also realizing there have been some historic and even deadly wildfires out that way and the Granite Mountain Fire of 2013 comes to mind, which unfortunately resulted in the loss of life of 19 of these hot shots, the Granite Mountain hot shots. And I think seeing all of this, the monsoonal rain, all of this burned out desert landscape really left a lasting impression. I know it did on me and I think to my two kids as well. The last time I was out this way for impacts from a tropical cyclone, that would be 2018 when I was out here for Hurricane Rosa. It came up out of the Baja region with a lot of moisture and I took a bunch of camera systems with me to set those up and monitor what was going on in Arizona especially. And I ended up out in rural Maricopa County, south of Phoenix, where the Waterman's Wash became flooded from a lot of rainfall in the mountains south of there and it literally cut the community in half for a couple of days because it takes a while for this water to drain away and for people to be able to cross these flooded washes where the roads go through and i just started thinking about all this you know what does it take really it doesn't happen very often but what does it take to get these tropical systems up into the southwest united states well it's got to actually track north and northeast enough to hit the lower 48 or baja california with that, we have the persistent high, and that's the steering flow for whatever's gonna happen. Typically, Pacific tropical cyclones, they generate right off the west coast of Mexico, and then they head west out into the ocean. Maybe a quick wave of Hawaii, something like that. Now, if the axis of the high shifts further west, further east, something like that, then it's got a better chance of working its way north and curving northeast. And that is what happened with Rosa in 2018. And while this moisture is badly needed and is often a welcome sight, it does come with impacts. Some areas that, like out here, uh, our average rainfall for the year is two to three inches. Sometimes we'll get that in an hour. And when that happens, the roads to the mountaintops that I work on get washed out. Uh, the lighting brings with it equipment damage. And the problem is, is again, we go back to that little bit of rain causes all of this water to come rushing through and people just don't realize the dangers there so if you're hiking if you're out sightseeing in your car the situation can get out of control just like that Again, I think that what draws me to this region more than anything is this stark and vivid contrast between when there's virtually no moisture out there at all and these time periods when a hurricane does come up out of the Pacific or maybe the monsoon is more active than normal and you get these times where the weather is very interesting for several days at a time. Now, of course, when I was out there in late July of 2020, the Eastern Pacific was pretty quiet, but we did have Hannah that developed in the Gulf of Mexico right about the time that I was getting ready to leave for Arizona. When it was just offshore, nobody thought it was gonna be much. In fact, Mark didn't even come to South Texas to see it because he didn't think it was gonna be anything. And then it ramped up and became a hurricane. Obviously, I hate to miss a landfall if I can help it, but in the case of Hannah, I really wasn't too concerned about it. The forecast from the National Hurricane Center was indicating that this storm, even if it developed into a hurricane, was more than likely going to track into an area of South Texas that is very sparsely populated, and in fact, it's almost impossible to get down to the coast itself. The area that it actually hit was probably the least populated area on the entire United States coastline because it was between Brownsville and Corpus Christi, about midway and there's really nothing out there but ranch land. So if Mark picked a storm to not go to, this was probably the one because he wouldn't have been able to get to it because he'd been right in the middle of a ranch somewhere. So it was interesting that when Hannah was making landfall, I was actually driving up through the Kaibab National Forest with my kids. And as you recall, this area had a terrible wildfire earlier in the summer of 2020. And as we drove up through this mountainous area, I was looking off to the left 
at this massive burned out forest. Everything was either black or gray and you know you hear that expression scorched earth. Well this was definitely scorched earth but as I looked off across the valley something caught my eye and I pulled off the highway and quickly put up my drone to go check out something that seemed rather unusual. Turns out it was this absolutely spectacular ash devil, literally owing its existence to the fact that the forest had burned down almost completely, leaving behind this dry, dusty, ash-filled, barren landscape. The heating of the day created this rising air that lofted all of this ash into this vortex, extending several hundred feet into the sky. It had been an amazing several days in the desert southwest. I was very glad that I was able to take a couple of my kids with me and show them what it is that I do just a little bit. Uh, I felt like it was very fulfilling and I needed that personally, especially considering what a challenging year 2020 had been up to this point. But now it was time to head back to North Carolina. August was near and things were about to get serious.